Okay, we're ready to start. Thank you all for joining. Uh, this is the first TinyML UK meetup, and I'm really excited to uh, be your host for today. Um, we're, we have a, a packed agenda. We are very lucky to be uh, here with Evgeny, one of the co-founders of uh, the TinyML Foundation, that will give an introduction on what TinyML is. Uh, so we'll start with that, and then we'll have um, the main talk from Dr. Nicholas Lane, talking about the deep transformation of mobile and embedded computing. So I'm really excited to uh, start today's first TinyML uh, UK meetup. And um, I've got a couple of slides of introduction before getting into uh, the, the meat of this, uh, of this meetup. So first of all, I wanted to uh, thank the TinyML sponsors, uh, DeepLight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and Syncense. And then, because this is the first uh, TinyML UK meetup, I wanted to introduce to you um, the awesome uh, people on the committee. So I'm just one of them, but uh, it's four of us, and uh, it's exciting to be part of this group and uh, be able to uh, offer, offer or give you the opportunity to see all these amazing talks. And this is just the first one. So I'm Alessandro Grande. I'm a developer advocate and I work for, for ARM. Um, my, my main role is to uh, help developers to uh, understand how to better uh, take advantage of the amazing hardware uh, devices out there. Then we have Dominic Binks, VP of Technology at Audio Analytic, and Gianmarco Iodice, ML Tech Lead um, at ARM, and then Neil Cooper, VP of Marketing at Audio Analytic. It's exciting to be a part of this uh, great committee, and I'm excited for uh, the opportunity to host the first meetup, and uh, I'm sure you'll get to learn more about the other committee members uh, during the next meetups. So, Another thing I wanted to, to mention here is that um, we, we are going to schedule a talk every uh, couple of months, more or less. And the next one is going to be on, the, uh, on November 10th at 4 p.m. UK. So if, uh, you know, we're excited to hear from you, uh, and I'm hoping that you know, we can talk about this at the end, but I'm excited to hear from you um, what, uh, what you want to hear about, what more things you want to talk about. And, um, and also, if you want to present, you can email talks at tinyml.org to actually um, share your, your ideas and presentation. Cool. Okay. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to leave the floor to Evgeny. Evgeny Gusev, Senior Director of Qua uh, Qualcomm AI Research and TinyML Foundation Co-Founder and Board of Director. Evgeny, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alessandro, for the introduction, and I'm really excited to be here at the first uh, inaugural event of uh, TinyML UK. Uh, we've been discussing this uh, for, for, for several months now, but because of the COVID situation and now the, uh, it took us some time to get it off the ground, but we are really excited to have a growing team of TinyML experts and enthusiasts in, in the UK. Uh, I think we are, uh, you're about like 200 people now and a lot of interest uh, in, in tiny, tiny ML there. So I, I'm just going to, to spend about like five minutes or so and to give an introduction what, uh, what tiny ML is and where tiny ML is heading both as a technology and also as the, as, as the organization, as, as a global ecosystem. So if you can, uh, oh, and also if you, if you have, have any questions, you can all, always contact me, you get it tinyml.org. Um, so first of all, um, what is TinyML? I, I think in, in a nutshell, that's the that's a set of technologies that enables uh, machine intelligence right next uh, uh, to the physical world. So on one hand, we have the physical world on, on, on the left, and the, the physical world is analog by definition, and then yet we live more and more in the digital world, especially these days. And TinyML is really a combination of these technologies that, that connect these two worlds. So typically it consists of, of, of some kind of sensor, uh, a device that converts analog into digital, and, and then you have a small processor that uh, processes this information. And TinyML, it's a set again of machine learning technologies that uh, does all this on-device analytics. It includes both hardware, software, uh, algorithms, uh, basically the whole full stack, and it does it at this uh, very, very small uh, form factor there. 
And what it does, this is uh, the most energy efficient way to, to, to do the, the machine learning on the cloud. It has all the privacy attributes and, uh, and uh, of extremely reliable by, by definition. So very broadly, we define tiny ML as a combination of uh, architectures, techniques, tools, and approaches that can do on-device analytics for all kinds of uh, sensing modalities. It can be vision, it can be audio, it can be motion, it can be chemical. You kind of name it uh, your application, and then you can apply uh, tiny ML techniques uh, to get all this all all device all device analytics at, at the boundary of the physical and, and the digital world. But what is important is that the tiny email techniques are extremely power efficient. So we're talking about like milliwatt type of range powers or below, and uh, in most cases this is for battery operated type of devices. So next slide, Alessandro, please. Yeah. And we all believe that uh, tiny ML is a massive opportunity. So it's going to be used in all kind of vertical where you need to have all device, on device analytics at extremely low power and in, in real time. So this, this graph on the right basically shows where it can be applied. It can be applied in the healthcare, industrial uh, IoT, smart homes, smart cities, uh, 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 augmented reality, uh, mixed reality, uh, home appliances, uh, drones, uh, security, uh, industrial IoT, all, all, uh, wearables, all, all kind of things there. And you, you, can, you can think about like each device or many devices that you wear or have at home or around you, they're gonna have, uh, and many of them already have this type of intelligence where you can do device analytics right at the, at the, at the, at the device. And this is all due to, due to the tiny ML. So that's why I think we are very bullish about tiny ML. You can think about uh, trillions of devices powered by tiny ML, and again, it's, it's a massive opportunity, and it's going to create a new in environment for all of us to live and to work because we can collect and digest data right uh, where where the sensing happens and make something useful information out of it, in both on on the human side, uh, society side, but also on the on the business side as well. So uh, we recognize this trend a couple of years ago. If, if you can advance to to the uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So we, we recognize uh, this trend uh, a couple of years ago, and that's how Tiny ML organization uh, started uh, started out of California here in the Bay Area, and uh, we had our first event at Google um, uh, in a year and a half ago, and since since then this community has grown to over 3,600 people now. And you can see it's kind of everywhere in, in, in the world. And, and the main idea and the main philosophy for the Tiny ML and Tiny ML Foundation is, is really to develop this open ecosystem of people who would like to either develop or use Tiny ML for, for their applications and, and again, drive this ecosystem, drive, drive these uh, opportunities forward. It includes, it's a very diverse ecosystem. It includes people with uh, hardware, software, system, algorithm, use cases, end users uh, uh, application. And you can see it's it's all, all, over, all over the world, very, very diverse, which is important. And again, we are very happy that the tiny ML group uh, in, in UK is growing very fast. I think I checked it this morning. It was 178 members already. So, and um, uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers of, of the of the Tiny ML UK, Alessandro, Gianmarco, uh, Dominique, and uh, Neil for for really being kind of the drivers for for the for the UK uh, ecosystem for the UK group. They've been quite passionate about this, and and that's why we we are here at, at the first inaugural event. Uh, th thank you, thank you. And uh, I think just to give you a little bit of an overview of what, what, what we do at the, at the Tiny ML Foundation, you can go to their website, tinyml.org, and you see all this information there. So as I said, we started with the summit. Uh, we had two summits every year. So next one uh, is being planned for, for next March. Uh, uh, and for now, we think it's going to be an in-person, or we hope it's going to be in-person event, uh, because it gives kind of the, the most experience. Uh, so we are going to have uh, Tiny ML Asia. This will be a virtual event in November, November 17, 18, a three-day event. 
So this is happening and, uh, and you're going to see announcements soon. And we were planning to have a European Middle East Africa event in uh, July, but again, due to the kind of environment we are, it got moved to next year. Uh, and while we are in this COVID type of situation, we are doing a lot of virtual things. Uh, we, we, we do this uh, meetups all over the world. As I said, it's 24 groups in, in 17 countries and, and growing. And we have bi-weekly bi bi -weekly webcasts like this. All the information is um, shared with, with the community openly on the YouTube channel. There are almost like 2,000 subscribers there. So it's really kind of, uh, again, the idea is to develop this massive ecosystem, very diverse ecosystem of people who are interested in developing TinyML and using TinyML for their, for their application. So I think at this point, I would like to give the stage back to Alessandro. And, and again, uh, thank you for, for your interest and thank you the, the local committee in, in UK, uh, Alexandra and Neil and Gianmarco and uh, Dominique who for really driving this um, uh, and making this happen. Thank you, Evgeny. Thank you for taking the opportunity to uh, give an introduction on TinyML and uh, what it means to you and you know the exciting opportunity ahead. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, now it's time for our, um, our other guest. Uh, and I'm excited to introduce to you uh, Nicholas Lane. Is a, he's a senior lecturer and associate professor, professor sorry, in the Department of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge, where he leads the Machine Learning Systems Lab. Uh, alongside his academic role, he's also a director um, at the Samsung AI Center in Cambridge. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's got a long um, um, academic career. He started at um, uh, the University of Waikato and then um, he got a master, master in engineering at the Cornell University and then a PhD at Dartmouth College. Um, without further ado, Nick, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. The stage is yours. And I'll stop sharing here and you can start sharing your screen. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, the kind of introduction. Uh, I will just start to share the slides and, uh, and we can begin. Um, again, it's, it's a real, um, real honour to be able to um, talk to you all today. I, I really appreciate the, the invitation. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, how far we've actually come. Uh, in this area of, of embedded uh, machine learning and advances that allow us to, to uh, run these machine learning algorithms directly on the device that afford us so many fantastic um, opportunities for things like privacy and low latency. And, and it really is, uh, it, was, it was great to have you, Vinny, really set the scene for this talk. I'm gonna talk about how far we've come and then lay out a few of the um, technologies that we've been um, developing, both at the University of Cambridge uh, with my PhD students, my postdocs, as well as um, around 20 other researchers that work on um, on-device and distributed AI um, topics at the uh, Samsung AI Center. So really, I'll be presenting work um, that is largely done by, by researchers there and, and in the um, University of Cambridge. Um, so I have to um, acknowledge their efforts. Um, so let's begin. Uh, this will be a familiar story to many of you. It's fantastic to actually give a talk in a, in a, in a, in a group of people who are already um, in the domain. So this, this won't really take much motivation at all. Um, what we study at Samsung and at Cambridge uh, are methods that allow us to uh, build uh, many machine learning based applications. And that's what's being shown here at the top here. And it, they range in, in, in complexity. Say from, for example, at the far extreme on the left hand side of the slide, you see um, sensor based automation. So these are the things, for example, that can unlock and open doors that allow a, a camera to be smart and intelligent and recognize a face. Um, uh, these things include, um, and I think these things extend upwards in terms of complexity to things very familiar to us. So, so speech and dialogue systems that we have in the home and, and then scaling out um, towards uh, uh, sensor and machine, lo um, machine learning based applications that can uh, you know, span entire cities. And then the, the real question, the heart of this question is how are we going to realize these types of systems that uh, all require uh, advanced forms of machine learning and what we study is how we can deliver them on a variety of systems. Uh, so we call these things high efficiency machine learning systems. They come in many forms. So one extent, of course, is the data center where they've traditionally resided, but increasingly we want to be able to, to realize them on a variety of form factors uh, ranging from um, uh, devices you might find in the home, 
um, and of course, even those that might move around in our urban environments. Um, when I think about this space, I, I get really excited because I think it really is becoming that one of the next frontiers of machine learning, where for a long time we had a lot of uh, focus on, on how accurate or robust a machine learning model would be, um, but we're now reaching this point uh, within this tiny uh, ML community and embedded AI more generally, uh, where it's, it's uh, being uh, joined by a new frontier where we want to be able to run these models uh, anywhere on, on anything, so any sort of device. And then, and also a third part of this equation is um, allowing them still to be accessible, so by anyone. So not necessarily in the hands of only certain corporations, but by having um, the ability to run these uh, models anywhere on anything and by anyone, we can democratize these out to, to NGOs, to smaller organizations and even uh, individuals. So um, what makes this hard? Why, why is this even a, a difficult thing? Well, one of the main reasons is the, the um, tremendous amounts of compute and data that uh, many of these machine learning uh, breakthroughs are being um, uh, required. And so this, this graph you probably have seen uh, a few times, it was produced by OpenAI. And, and essentially what it shows us on the y-axis is uh, a log scale of the, the operations it takes to train many familiar uh, machine learning systems. So uh, on the uh, x-axis we see years and, and it goes back all the way to 2012 when we see familiar models such as AlexNet. And then if we see things progressing throughout the years, we see things like VGG that was developed in Oxford. We see um, all the way up to recent innovations from places like um, uh, DeepMind with AlphaGo. And um, what we quickly see is that um, there's, a, there's a dramatic increase uh, year on year on year on the amount of compute that these models require. And for that reason, it's a, it's a never ending fight on us being able to uh, deliver these machine learning models on compact uh, devices that have limited amounts of memory and compute. Um, now, when I first started to look at this area and discuss it, um, I'd have to almost motivate the need of why we'd need to um, put machine learning on the device. Um, but now, sort of, you know, five years later, after this area has been studied, we have a, a wonderful um, sorts of outcomes. So this is just one particular application that you can now download and install on just an off-the-shelf smartphone that's heavily using on-device uh, AI. So this is a, um, an application from, from Microsoft. It's called Seeing AI. And what it's, uh, what it's aiming to do is uh, allow people with uh, limitations in their sight to have a larger awareness of what's going on around them. And so on this uh, regular smartphone application, uh, we have embedded inside it uh, a number of state-of-the-art machine learning models that are doing vision tasks. You can, in this particular um, illustration, you can point at a, at a, at a, at a woman and it can give you an image caption, right? So this is a canned image, of course, so it's working fairly well. You see the, uh, uh, the picture here is of this lady and then you look at the caption and it's fairly accurate. It even um, tries to guess her age. A 28 year old female wearing glasses looking very happy. And, and this really is a testament to how far we've come. So in, in uh, I would say over the last five years through the development of a variety of um, techniques, um, quantization, pruning, um, new architectures like mobile nets, innovations in hardware, we've come a long way and we can now deliver uh, models uh, on smartphones and increasingly on microcontrollers. So if we look at sort of the, the years, if so, if, if we look at what's happened over the last five years, on the left hand side I'm illustrating here some of the um, sort of accomplishments of um, my research group in terms of being able to develop models that uh, work on constrained devices on the right hand side is a, is a more complete list of, of those works that are done by a variety of other people. Um, and the point here is that we've come a long way. Um, I can even show you, for example, it's now, it, it, it's, um, it's been possible now to run limited amounts of machine learning on microcontrollers ever since uh, 2016. And um, so this is a result that, sh that we had back in, in 2016, where we're actually looking at how you can use um, Google Speaker ID on um, ARM Cortex M0 and M3 processors. And, and the, so this figure is showing you y-axis energy, x-axis uh, latency. And then the, the main uh, takeaway here is that the red point is the sort of prior to compression methods. Um, so you might have, for example, 
in the case of a speaker ID on an ARM Cortex M3, um, with, a, with a lot of engineering, you could get them to run on the order of tens of minutes, but with, it, um, with compression, you can push down the inference time all the way down to, to um, just a single minute. Um, and so again, this is all directing our attention to how far we've come. Um, but the heart of this talk uh, is that I think we've still got a long way to go. Uh, so this, this, you might wonder, well, what's the connection with this image? And this is an image of um, the Tenzing uh, Hillary Airport in Nepal. And, and what's uh, interesting about this airport is that at the end of this runway is a, a 700 meter drop. And, and, I, and uh, I use this image to ask the question, pose a, a, a point of discussion for us to all to engage in. Uh, are we approaching rapidly this point of um, a, a precipice where the techniques that we've used for the last five years and the ones I was mentioning earlier, so we have um, some really interesting methods related to quantization, uh, pruning, new types of architectures, leaning on, on accelerators and so forth that have gotten us a long way to compressing these models so that we can run them on smartphones and so on. It's becoming almost a norm. Um, as machine learning starts to advance and it becomes more complicated, as we ride that curve that I showed you on the OpenAI uh, graph, as we see the needs of compute uh, increasing, doubling every three months, uh, what are we going to do next that allows the next generation of models to be able to run with low latency, high accuracy, and so on, as they get larger and larger and more complex? Um, and it's, and it's, it's my uh, assertion that we're going to have to start to think a little bit differently about how we approach these problems. And uh, compression alone, um, I think, will not be enough. Um, and so here, here is... Uh, four uh, distinct directions that I think are important to, to lean on heavily uh, moving forward if we're going to be able to handle increasing complexity of machine learning and perhaps even increasing demands of consumers of what, who want to experience richer and richer, more powerful forms of AI. Um, now, this is meant to be a fairly a short talk of around half an hour, so I'm only going to focus on the first two of these. I'll speak a little bit about the last two just in passing and then and provide some, um, some points for discussion uh, towards the end. Um, so let's look at these first two topics. Uh, the first I've called is uh, think different. And, and by think different, I'm saying, uh, I think it's time that we start to think more radically about how we do our machine learning. So it's not really a question of thinking of how can we make existing models uh, and those that are being invented more efficient, but can we start to think of building blocks that exists that we form our machine learning models from that are inherently uh, uh, more scalable and efficient and, and more compatible with the types of, of hardware uh, that we have available. And um, so the, 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 the biggest thrust here is this notion of, of the need to invent uh, new learning algorithms that have, uh, uh, aren't, uh, aren't driving towards being more compact uh, and compressible but that are actually inherently more flexible and, and there's a diversity of them, meaning that we have a variety of ways that we try to learn. There's a variety of ways that we have inference. Um, right now, if you, if, if you look at the types of algorithms that are being used right now, there's a, there's a very uh, small number of designs to them, right? There's not a huge uh, variety of ways that we're having to do training right now on the device. There's not a huge diversity of the ways that we do inference, uh, although it is expanding. And so I want to explain and add uh, some more detail to this direction by explaining just one small step we're taking towards this, um, where we're trying to develop uh, alternative ways of building machine learning models that are, are more able to be inherently more efficient. And um, the, the particular technique I'll be talking about is really driving towards having models that have a, a vast reductions in uh, data movement. Okay, and so to explain this idea, I want to take you uh, and just consider a ResNet 34 uh, CNN architecture. And then as we all would know, um, the heart of the operations that occur within this model are the, the convolution kernels. And that's what's being illustrated here. Um, and of course, in the ResNet architecture, there's also these skip connections. Um, now, the, the big idea that we're using here is to take each of these convolution kernels and um, start to uh, be able to trade off uh, memory for compute, whereby instead of uh, describing and, and uh, each of these kernels uh, with all the parameters inside them, 
what we want to do is replace each kernel with instead uh, a simple function. We asked the question, uh, can we come up with a function that would uh, be able to generate kernels that are then going to be useful for learning later on? And if we can do that, then we can start to uh, replace uh, the kernels and all these parameters that they, they contain uh, with easily described functions. Because if we can do that, we can then start to trade off uh, uh, data and memory uh, that are normally used to describe these parameters with uh, cheap to compute functions. We can trade off essentially memory and data movement for compute. And that would be a very useful, powerful primitive if we can do that. Um, the way that we uh, uh, decided to, to realize this concept was uh, in the context of a CNN, uh, we're going to use um, a series of orthogonal binary bases. So we use these because they're very cheap to compute in hardware. And then the design of the architecture is to replace um, full um, for floating point uh, kernels with uh, these uh, synthesized binary basis that are then combined by a small number of learned coefficients um, that when um, collectively used have the same um, outcome as using the, you know, the, the full kernel with all of its parameters. So the idea here is that uh, we only have to learn a small number of coefficients that allow us to combine the orthogonal binary basis together and by that way we don't have to describe in terms of the model parameters uh, all the uh, parameters of the kernel. So what does this mean? This, so this, this means that inference time, uh, we, no, uh, we no longer have to have the full model described. Uh, all we need to do is either you know, move in from memory or move within the memory to the processing unit, uh, the learned coefficients that allow us to combine uh, these uh, binary basis uh, and to provide this memory and compute trade-offs. Um, one of the key questions uh, that you'll need to answer if you're going to try to, to do this is, uh, can this technique actually learn anything? We've now introduced a lot of uh, um, constraints to what the kernels are. Um, and so this, what this, uh, this is the first result I want to show you. Um, this is uh, a comparison of, of uh, um, architectures. Each in this table, the top line of each, there's three pairs of architectures shown on this left-hand side. The, the first entry uh, is the um, top one accuracy achieved for that architecture when learned uh, on the CIFAR um, 10 data set. And directly underneath is the exact same architecture, but in each case of the, of the kernels, we've replaced it with this uh, idea of a small number of coefficients that are learned uh, as a, in combination with a series of binary bases. And what, what this uh, table shows us is the accuracies are maintained and uh, and it's indicating that this uh, alternative way of describing the architectures is in fact able to, um, to learn successfully. And, and not only learn successfully, but it be uh, equivalent in terms of its accuracy as the, as the conventional side of architecture. Um, let me show you now what are the potentials for um, improvement of speed uh, um, um, and, and uh, model size. So on the right hand side, we've got this general purpose technique um, and we're, um, we are uh, looking at the use case of trying to detect um, hot keywords. So this is uh, that we've trained the model now on a completely different data set to show its generality uh, using the speech command data set. Um, accuracy is being shown on the, on the sort of the y-axis, the x-axis is model size, and we're comparing it against a, a variety of other um, architectures. In particular, uh, this uh, DSCNN is one um, developed by ARM, and then this uh, are results uh, for it being tested on a, on a Cortex uh, microcontroller. And now what I've done is highlight in red uh, a series of architectures that are being, um, uh, that are using this uh, binary um, orthogonal basis technique. And what we can see is that while we have to lose a little bit in terms of accuracy, we're able to reduce the model size um, by, by dramatic amounts. Now, um, the final part of the story, though, is that this design of, of architecture uh, is really going to work well with hardware that's designed specifically for it. So just recently, we started to explore this direction. Um, and that's what I'm showing you here. We, we designed a, a chip, an FPGA design, actually, that, that we call Unzip FPGA. And uh, what's different about this um, accelerator 
than, uh, than other types of accelerators is that there's a purpose built, and I mean, how do we highlight this? There's a purpose built module where the whole role of this module uh, is to just uh, constantly generate these uh, um, orthogonal binary basis. It's a specialized uh, module, and because of that, they're very, very cheap and fast to compute. And then um, what happens is that we, uh, we also have to specialize the, the, the PEs, the CNE en engines, um, such that they can access the different uh, parts of the weights that are generated uh, by the weight inflation uh, module. Um, this is then combined with the input that comes uh, uh, to the chip. Uh, and, and, and in concert, by working together, um, because we don't have to uh, store all the parameters of the model itself, uh, we can drastically reduce the amount of times it needs to have to go off trip. Um, and by, by uh, finishing off this part of the puzzle, we can start to see um, what happens to things like our throughput when you adopt this design of a model. And so that's what I'm showing you here. Um, these results are for um, doing object recognition again. So I've, I've moved from, I started off with um, SIFR 10 using object recognition type of workload. Then I showed you what would happen under an audio task. And now I've gone back to uh, that of object recognition again, but on a much data, data set, this is ImageNet, the left-hand side are, are throughput numbers. Um, so this is throughput using um, our unzip FPGA with our design of this a particular type of model. Um, there are two variations of model being shown, um, gray and black, depending on how much uh, smaller you want to uh, make the model, how much of a reduction in data movement you want to have. And it's being compared uh, to um, uh, an, an efficient FPGA implementation of, of, a, of a pruned CNN um, called tape pruned. And uh, for, you can see for different amounts of um, off-chip uh, memory bandwidth, uh, we're seeing increases of 2x or more um, of our technique. And if you cast your eyes to the right-hand side, you can see um, how our technique, uh, which is being shown here and uh, highlighted as a DBFNet 50 and 25, is actually able to maintain under ImageNet um, uh, data sets very high levels of top one accuracy, so nearly 70%, um, but also uh, an excellent uh, you know, levels of, of throughput through the chip. So that's what's being shown on the right-hand side, the far right of this table. Um, so in comparison to regular pruned models, um, so we have different variations of the TAE te technique and the actual original ResNet model where the compression there is the top line. Um, now. Okay, so that, so that is, um, this is one picture, one part of the story where we're looking at how can we invent uh, new types of models that are, that are compatible with uh, some of the types of desires we have for, for fast inference um, and, and fitting in with the constraints of the devices we have. Uh, the second part of the story that I really wanted to, to share with you is our work on, on what I call automated specialization. So this is a, a bigger idea uh, whereby we want to start to invent new types of tools uh, that can enable people to, um, to focus and specialize their models uh, far more intently for the hardware at, at hand. And so the bigger sort of uh, concept driving this research is an ambition towards being able to automatically uh, synthesize or generate uh, neural network models largely that are, that are hyper-specialized for target and chip platforms um, that you have uh, at hand and the task at which you want to really excel at. And we want to be able to do this at levels that are, that are far exceeding uh, what is conventionally possible uh, by hand. So essentially we want to be able to do this at a superhuman uh, level. That's the, that's the big goal. And I want to now share with you just one example of the work we're doing in this direction. Um, where we are combining ideas of AutoML uh, and optimization of hardware uh, towards being able to achieve this type of, of idea, at least going one small step towards the, that concept. So I'm going to run through this um, fairly quickly. I see we've got about uh, 10, 12 minutes left. Um, the core idea is that uh, conventionally, on the left-hand side, the conventional approach is that you would design your hardware. So, you know, I mean, you, I'm sorry, you design your architecture. So you might um, maybe come up with a new type of mobile net that has some really nice properties 
uh, is a nice uh, small form factor. It plays well with your hardware really well. And then you go to the hardware side of it. And maybe you develop an accelerator that can do really well with your model. Um, and these two, um, these two paradigms are traditionally separate. Uh, what we're interested in this line of work is asking a, a, a very simple question. And that is, if we can start to perform um, these two types of optimizations uh, concurrently and mix them, can we find new opportunities for even further um, advances in combinations of accuracy, throughput, and, and generally performance? Um, so far, we've examined uh, this type of direction uh, in a variety of different types of applications. So I can share a couple of them with you and then dr drill down into one. So the first of these is in the area of speech recognition. And then, so within the researchers at, at Samsung, we've developed um, ideas in this direction that have then um, shown it's possible to not only um, accelerate a model, um, but also reduce its uh, word error rate. And this is under um, the LibriSpeech um, uh, data set. Um, through the co-optimization of both the architecture, so that's the actual architecture that you're using, and how it works with the hardware. And so we're um, comparing uh, on this top line a state-of-the-art streaming um, on-device model to one that has been found uh, through this uh, type of search process. And so what, and what the important takeaway here is not only are we increasing its uh, inference uh, time on the same hardware, but we've even found a way to reduce the, the word error rate. And so going lower is better here. So this is what I call um, being able to do things at a superhuman level. Um, let's talk about a completely different context, showing the generality of the approach. Um, this is just a result, but they're using the same style of method. Uh, here is an example of doing the task of super resolution. So the idea here is that you have a lower resolution image. You want to uh, make it a higher resolution one, um, but you want to do this with uh, where the image looks uh, uh, very good, very uh, you know, uh, pleasing to the eye. Um, so at the bottom line um, is our method, and uh, the other two are state of the art uh, methods for doing. Uh, the first one is the state of the art method for doing this when you don't care about constraints. And then this is being um, judged, the quality of the image is being judged by this um, LPIPS metric where lower is better. Um, you'll see first this first line, um, it has a pretty good uh, um, outcome, um, but it comes at a huge cost in terms of uh, multi-ads and parameter size of the model. Uh, the next line is state of the art in terms of hand-designed compact models that do the same task. So you'll see there's a dramatic change in the amount of parameters needed and how many multi-ads are needed inference time. And then finally, here's an automated discovered solution where you have particular hardware in mind, you're optimizing for that hardware while still trying to jointly optimize for things like uh, image quality. And you can see again, we're able to nearly meet uh, the, the level of um, the set of the art uh, case where you don't care about the constraints um, while still holding down drastically the, the multi-ads. Now, I just want to, um, let me fast forward a little few slides just to um, keep in time. So the final example I want to drill down a little bit is illustrated here. And this is where we're directly co-designing um, for a CNN architecture and the hardware. And we want to explore this in the, in the richest space possible, and that would be um, that of an FPGA engine, where we have full control over the different types of um, hardware options available to us, as well as the, the different designs of the CNNs. And so if you follow my uh, numbering, um, this joint optimization and search approach starts at stage one. You are exploring the, the CNN search space for different types and styles of neural architectures, uh, you know, using one by one convolutions, using three by three and so forth. Step two, um, you're looking at what turns out to be, a, a, in this particular design of the tool, a smaller search space of the hardware uh, on the FPGA, but you're um, coming up with designs of, of how big the input buffer should be, how, how big should the weight buffer be, um, should we specialize the convolution engines to be really good at one by one or three by three, these type of uh, decisions. Uh, step four is that you need a very good um, predictor 
of the performance of the model candidates you're considering on the actual hardware before you put it on the hardware itself, because that feeds directly into step four here. This is the, the optimization that you feed into a reinforcement uh, learning reward um, that, uh, that after iterating on this process leads you to results such as the following. And this is the third example of this approach that I'm explaining before I move on. And you can, you, you find results like this. And these are really interesting because we want to compare ourselves to um, designs of architectures that were performed by hand and in this case, by people who understood the target hardware uh, deeply. So this is um, the, the three blocks you see on the figure to your left, uh, triangle, uh, circle, and, and uh, blue, are different types of architectures, ResNet, GoogleNet, and SqueezeNet, but these have been designed by uh, the hardware folks at Xilinx uh, to run really well on the particular FPGA board that we're interested in. And then what I'm showing you with all these other uh, Xs that you see on this figure, these are automatically find, uh, found operating points uh, that are uh, combinations of, of FPGA parameterization and CNN architectures, and that's showing you the latency of running on this particular hardware um, and the accuracy that results. And what you see is this automated tool is able to dominate all of these hand found solutions. Um, and so what, by using this tool, again, in this third type of, uh, of, of uh, domain, um, we're again able to um, establish what is a, a new state of the art in terms of the amount of accuracy that you're able to achieve and the, the throughput that comes from this particular type of hardware. And even in this case, we're able to specify object, objectives such as hardware area and optimize on those uh, as well. And so here we have, again, another an automated solution found by a tool um, operating in the, in the way I'm talking about, where we're not only seeing um, higher levels of accuracy, um, but also lower levels of latency. Those are very, uh, two very hard things to, to achieve at the same time. And then that is, uh, that's the second part of, in terms of, of automated specialization. Um, as I mentioned, I don't have time to talk about these uh, uh, point three and point four. Um, point three is really um, examining ways by which we can have models uh, do a far better job of sharing resources between them as we start to transition to systems that run more than one model at the same time. And step four is really pushing very hard on, on what are the next generation of, of hardware that we may have available to us. Uh, we've been thinking about things such as um, in-sensor or near-sensor processing, um, pushing forward harder on analog compute, and even uh, you know, new forms of, of, of hardware that is, that is um, harvesting energy um, from the environment. Um, but I wanted to, to wrap up this talk uh, by, um, by uh, positing two predictions as we move forward. Um, and uh, the first of these is, is really uh, the suggestion that we've, we've gone so far with inference and accelerating inference. Some people might feel that we've really, you know, reached the end of the, the line and we already know well how to do many things. But I would say that this is really just uh, the early, day, early stages of this domain. Because if you think of what's going to come next, I feel that we're going to really need our systems to not only perform inference, because after all, inference assumes that training is done elsewhere, the system, once it's released into the environment, is really not studying, is not um, learning at all. It's not advancing, it's not adapting to its conditions. And if you push further on this line of thought, we really need to be able to reach a point where these systems that are running these machine learning models are, are running what I want to call a cognitive embedded stack. So one that is not only doing inference, which you could call perception or doing discriminative tasks, but has additional layers of capabilities, such as understanding what's going on, some notion of common sense and even perhaps being able to reason over these pieces of information. And if you think of it in these terms, we're only at a very early stage of being able to perform any of these things um, locally under resource con, um, constraints. Um, and and towards, towards this end, I just wanted to um, advertise a framework that we've recently um, launched called Flower. And it allows uh, specifically for embedded devices. It's an open source piece of software. It allows you to have um, embedded devices of all kinds, um, collectively performing learning tasks uh, under a federated setting. And what it really excels at is being able 
to uh, account for a lot of the uh, resource issues such as memory, compute heterogeneity, energy and so forth that are, that are going to be inherent in any type of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning um, deployment. Um, my final prediction uh, that I wanted to, to put out there is that um, right now efficiency is framed as being often a trade-off between um, the level of accuracy that you don't want to give away and uh, for, for gains in performance. But I think moving forward, as uh, machine learning starts to, um, starts to evolve, we're going to see that efficiency is going to go hand in hand with increased level of accuracy. This is, a, this is a, a, what I want to posit. Uh, and you might say, why is that? Well, one of the examples I want to give is last year's um, efficiency net result. So this is a, an, a, an architecture that not only is able to dominate uh, others in terms of its top one accuracy on ImageNet, but actually uh, is lower in the number of parameters and uh, the, the related compute costs. And I think we're going to see, I think this is just an early beacon of what is going to come moving forward. If you think about um, efficient models will have so many advantages over their inefficient cousins, such as being able to consume larger and larger amounts of data, being able to scale up to larger and larger architectures, being able to be automatically um, designed by heavy, compute heavy architecture search types of techniques. Um, I think these things, these factors are gonna to come together to enable um, efficiency to being, uh, to being a, a key uh, characteristic of models that are also highly accurate moving forward. So that's uh, something I want to put out there for discussion. Um, and, and with that, I'm happy to take questions and uh, continue on. Again, thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to uh, discuss with you all. Thank you, Nicholas. That was, uh, that was an awesome uh, first talk for our uh, Tiny ML UK meetup. It was, it's great to, to have you and, uh, and uh, yeah, it was a really interesting talk. I really actually liked your two predictions. Uh, thought really, really interesting. Uh, the second one, efficiency will lead to higher accuracy. I think that's, uh, that's a really interesting thought. Um, I've, I've studied physics, so you know, to me, like, beauty is in, simpli in the simplicity of things, right? And I think uh, it, it kind of, uh, that kind of, you know, it, it's, it's a similar thought applied to machine learning. So it's really interesting to hear. And it was interesting to actually see that there is a model that's much more simpler that's actually uh, giving better results. So. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's just a trend that I think we're going to see increasingly um, happen, which is great for us because there's, a, there's this constant um, pushback on accuracy declines when you try to make things efficient. Yeah, exactly. And and I mean, you know, TinyML is about having things efficiently work on 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 constrained devices. So I think you know, if if we can have cons more efficient models, uh, we'll definitely have more TinyML, right? So this is awesome. Sure. sure. Cool. So we've got a couple of uh, questions. Before that, let me just share my screen again. Um, I'm gonna... Okay, so um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to open the floor to questions in a second, but I wanted to first um, open this poll. So I'm going to launch it and you guys, everybody can, it'd be awesome if you could answer uh, I'll leave it on for a couple of minutes. While I do that, we can talk about um, some of the questions that we already got. And everybody that wants um, to ask any questions to Nick or, or Evgeny, uh, feel free to post questions on the Q&A um, section. We've got already a few questions, so we can go through those to start with. Um, so the first one, I wanted to just uh, note that the, both the slides and the recording will be available uh, on uh, TinyML um, website. So, um, you know, look out for that. It will be available in the next couple of days. We've got a few questions on that. So just wanted to point that out. Um, cool. So let's go to Vincata's question. So um, they've asked, is there a reduction in number of parameters in, the, um, in your deterministic binary filters approach? Uh, yes, yes. So because you only have to learn the parameters that combine the, the binary filters, um, you do get a lot of, um, a large reduction in the number of parameters that needs to be learned for the model. And that, that's why it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, 
from those fewer number of parameters, can you still learn um, well? And that's what the first result is trying to indicate, that it does seem that you can. Cool. Um, a more general question, I guess, to you as, uh, you know, if you put your academic hat on, <laughs> um, Himans Shu, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, um, is asking whether um, you have any insights on the industrial PhD program in data science, specifically ML. Um, uh, in general, I think it's a, it's a great time to be, uh, I, I think this is a, this is what the, the question is asking. I, I think it's a, a great time to be entering the area um, it's very exciting um, time with industry, and I think I think you're going to see machine learning um, um, pervade into many industries. So you have a lot of opportunities. Thank you, um, Alessandro. Actually, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, great presentation, Nick. Re really enjoyed it. I mean, a lot of really cool cool points there. But I got quite excited and interested about your your flower tool because I do believe that this kind of distributed uh, federated learning would be a way to go for this kind of uh, sensor ML type tiny ML type of devices. Sure, sure. Could you elaborate a little bit? Like, what are the key, key features of this tool? How, how do you do it? How how is it different, for example, from the Google federated learning? Uh, and uh, uh, this is a better tool. Like, what do we expect from the future? Well, so um, we're using the tool largely to explore. So actually, it's, it's very, it's surprisingly difficult to um, put together uh, embedded devices that are clearly trying to learn something. So we, uh, um, because, uh, well, actually, one of the big problems is, is still in the actual ability of the device to learn itself. So we don't directly um, solve that. So you need to write your own libraries that do, you know, backward pass and so on. Uh, and, but what the tool does is uh, sits on top of existing um, machine learning frameworks. So you can uh, you know, roll together um, different types of PyTorch and TensorFlow, and it sits on top of it, enabling things, these things to be combined together. Um, so uh, the types of, we, we're starting to develop, a, a, inside the, the framework are a couple of techniques. Uh, one of these being a, a technique we call fast and slow. So that tries to handle the issue that you have uh, uh, some devices lag severely in being able to participate. Um, but you want to have them still uh, contribute their gradients within the larger uh, framework. And so we basically have a, a selection process that decides whether it's a good idea to include its, its contributions or not, given the type of information available to it. Um, but, but largely the, the tool is, is for exploration. So allowing people to, to prototype um, embedded devices, well, actually more broadly embedded and mobile, um, and even simulate these conditions. So one of the problems that we found was uh, we wanted to evaluate existing federated learning algorithms, but under um, settings that are far more um, heterogeneous than they're typically evaluated. Typically they're evaluated assuming, oh, okay, I have a, a number of, of quite capable nodes. Maybe they all got GPUs perhaps, and they're all relatively as powerful. Um, but there was no way to evaluate conditions, for example, where you might have um, one node very underpowered because you have an embedded device participating. And, and we've already found um, results such as um, if, if you know, one, one result says that, um, say if you have 50 devices, they're all trying to train um, an object detection um, network, but just one of those devices has only CPU available. Every other device has a GPU available. Um, you can see training times jump up 3X, 4X, and, and, that's, and that's simply because of that um, lagging node. Um, but, but, but my point is that even if you see a little bit of heterogeneity in the um, network, of, of, of contributing um, clients, you see the existing, and this is compared on existing algorithms. So, you know, obviously Fed average, but um, a, a number of three or four other ones that have been recently um, released, and they all have this uh, same, you know, problem. Um, and th that's natural because they haven't been evaluated under these conditions. So I'm not really saying, I'm not really pointing fingers. We just noticed there was uh, a need for, for easy ease of experimentation. And I just, before I might be going too much about this, but I just want to say, I've talked a, bit, a lot about um, compute but it's also about the connectivity, so you can play with the wireless conditions um, and, um, and energy, oh, obviously a big one too. Cool, thank you. Thank you to everyone that answered the poll. Um, unfortunately, we had the wrong name uh, on the poll, but it was obviously related to uh, Nick's presentation. Um, apologies for that. I, I wanted to take another question from the from the audience, from Revonda that's asking, could it be possible to crowdsource the various tiny MLs uh, of a certain type and discover a more globally accurate, efficient model? 
Any, th yeah. any thoughts on that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, um, it, I mean, it, 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 is it, uh, I, would, I would say it, it boils down to what type of task you're doing. But increasingly, I think, as algorithms start to be able to consume local data better, so meaning um, unsupervised techniques or weekly supervised techniques, because that's really the bottleneck. Uh, right now, uh, if you wanted to deploy some sort of federated system and you want to have uh, local data being added into the mix, um, someone is going to have to add the supervised signal to it. Um, maybe the user or maybe by you know, someone expect, in, in expecting the data. Um, but I think once we start to, um, and it seems this, you know, in the last sort of 18 months, we're making quite strong progress in the ability to do different types of unsupervised learning. So I think when you have that added with the capability of doing things like federated learning, where you're learning from locally available data, um, then we're going to have far better systems because they're going to be trained on data that's actually what they're experiencing in situ. So rather than having some, uh, you know, perhaps out of date or, or relatively much smaller amount of data that can be collected centrally, think like things like ImageNet, um, when, if when we can start to use data that all the devices that are, are observing locally, um, then we can have uh, yeah, more generalizable systems. Cool. Well, thank you again, Nick. This was awesome. Uh, thank you for, for being here with us. And um, I'm, I'm about to wrap this up as we only have a couple of minutes left. So uh, thank you. Thank you again, one last time. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. So I just wanted to um, quickly thank again, all the sponsors uh, for the Tiny Mel Foundation. So DeepLight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated and Syn Synsense. Um, I wanted to say that you're going to get these slides or you're going to have access to these slides. So uh, you're going to find on the slides uh, information about all these different sponsors. So you can read more about them um, when you read the slides. And um, I wanted to remind everyone to uh, set your calendars for Tuesday, November 10th, where we're going to have our um, second UK talk uh, or UK Tiny ML uh, meetup. It's going to be at 4 p.m. UK. And um, this is the last one we've scheduled for the year. And obviously, we're all hoping that next year we can start uh, in-person events. We'll see what happens. Uh, if not, we'll continue uh, having a talk every couple of months. So um, keep this in your calendar. And uh, for any anyone interested in presenting or uh, talking to us directly, uh, feel free to reach out at talks at tinyml.org. And uh, I'm going to close on this uh, on this slide, but I wanted to really thank all the attendees. Um, I wanted to also thank the the rest of the uh, UK Tiny Mel committee that has helped a lot with the organization of this. Obviously, it wasn't it wasn't me. It wasn't just me. Uh, it was a team effort. And uh, I also wanted to talk to thank the Tiny Mel Foundation, Global Foundation. It was really helpful to have their support and their help uh, with this. So thank you for you know providing all the technical support and the logistics and everything. Uh, it was awesome. And um, lastly, I wanted to also thank uh, the speakers, obviously, again. Uh, thank you, Nick and, uh, and uh, Evgeny for being with us and speaking today. And really thank everyone for being here and uh, looking forward to being with you next time uh, in November. Thank you.